All right, welcome back, everybody. Thirsty Thursday, number 11. Uh, this week, we are incredibly excited to be joined by Miss, uh, or Captain, sorry, Lisa Shield <laughs> of the Alaska State Fire Marshal's Office. Uh, she's the Rural Fire Training Specialist. Uh, and as we get into this and we get going, uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about is the definition of rural. Uh, as you guys can all imagine, uh, life in Alaska is a little bit different, which is kind of where we're going to start our conversation tonight. Um, and, and then go into the fire service and how that affects the different areas. Um, but ultimately what we're going to be talking about is, is how we're doing training, um, making it realistic and applicable to where you are um, to make sure that, you know, we have effective uh, forces in place to help provide and prevent and, and take care of, you know, anything that we might have come up. Um, so like I said, it's going to be a great show tonight. Um, I can tell you, Lisa and I were on the phone, um, was it last week? I can't remember when it was. We were on the phone for two hours, almost two hours and 15 minutes, um, just getting set up and and, and um, ready for this. So um, since then, I've been super excited. I know talking with Trevor and Bobby, we are all uh, just in that same boat. So before we start kicking this around, again, I'm Ben, uh, Salisbury, Maryland, uh, captain with the Salisbury Fire Department. Um, one thing that we are going to do a little different tonight is if you guys are watching, please do us a favor, scroll all the way down. Uh, if you're on YouTube and put a comment in there as to where you're from and on Facebook, if you guys could just put a comment uh, so that way we can see where people are watching. Uh, so that way if we're talking about something and um, we get a comment, we might reach out or send you a message through uh, Facebook or YouTube to see, you know, how you guys might do things where you are. Um, and if there's something where we get jammed up, hey, we might ask you. We've um, in talking with Trevor and Bobby, Strike the Box has always been about, hey, we're going to bring you experience. Uh, we're not going to bring you all the knowledge and everything else that goes along with it, but we'll bring you some experience uh, and some of our, our history and some of our uh, past practices. So with that being said, I'm going to kick it over to the boss and Trevor, take it away. Great. Thanks, Ben. Um, like we said, we're really, really thrilled to have Lisa on tonight uh, or as She's otherwise known in the uh, UPI community as a maniac. Did I get it correct? You did. Outstanding. Look at that. Hey, even a blind squirrel finds not every now and then. So <laughs> this is, um, we've had the opportunity, um, especially Bobby and I, to travel to so many places throughout the country and, and teach and instruct and really just kind of share experiences and uh, share some background with people. And when we had the opportunity to go and meet with Lisa up in Alaska, we saw so is such unique things that we're going to talk about tonight but what we experienced was probably not even a fraction of what the, the entire state has to offer and, and just some of the unique uh, features and as we've been through different places in the country we see where some people are very uh, standards driven and other places they try to meet the standards but at the same time they have to be very very realistic as far as what they can provide uh, with their cap within their capabilities and limitations so Really looking to get into that conversation uh, with Lisa tonight and having her share her experiences uh, in the multitude of places up there, uh, most of which don't have roads uh, interconnecting. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna hear some really great stuff. So with that, uh, Bobby, I'll pitch it over to you. Oh, thanks, Trevor. Welcome, Lisa. It's good to have you Hi. here virtually. That's awesome. Good to see you again. Um, uh, ben and uh, Trevor had talked to me a little bit about. Um, as we all know, there was a, a large explosion in Beirut, Lebanon. And um, Ben had asked me to talk a little bit about that. Uh, in 1982, when I had joined the Navy, uh, that was my first uh, my first tour was in the multinational peacekeeping force over in Beirut, Beirut Lebanon. Um, as a very young guy, at 17 years old, I was very confused, and they told me that uh, the the pilot, the PLO had left. Israel and Israel had chased them in and then Syria was mad because of the difference between Muslims and Christians and, and, and many things that I truly didn't understand. I didn't watch the, the news much back then. Um, and it was a very, very devastating war when I was there. Um, the, the town was completely destroyed. Um, all Everywhere we went was very bad at that time. Um, and this, this blast has kind of set them back again. But I just really quick wanted to tell you just about the Lebanese people. So Lebanon's considered a Christian country, um, but really, um, if you're if you're in that area, it's it's kind of like saying that this country would be Republican or Democrat. Um, it's, there's 
both types of people and all types of people in all those countries in the Middle East, um, in that area of the world. Uh, but one thing that I remember was when we met the people in Lebanon, they were the most wonderful people you could ever meet. Um, I, I remember one time we did, uh, we were doing some shore stuff and uh, we went up into the mountains to a really nice restaurant. We had something to eat and talking about their history and in the middle of all their cypress trees, which is part of their flag and things like that. So um, there are many, many, many firefighters are missing um, and uh, are certainly presumed dead. Uh, so our, my thoughts and prayers go out with uh, everyone in, in Beirut, Lebanon, as we get this all started. Um, and uh, I certainly hope find, they find some solace in their lives and, and get back to some normalcy soon. So um, with that, welcome, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, you're probably one of the most interesting people I met in my traveling and teaching. Uh, for the history <laughs> you gave me. So um, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and get us started, that'd be awesome. Um, what I said was in Inupak, good morning, good day, um, welcome. We, my name is Amenyak. My English name is Lisa Shield. I'm from Selawik and I grew up in Kotzebue. Now I live in Eagle River. My grandfather is Almond Downey and my grandmother is Ruth Downey. My parents are Terry, Sue, and Ethel. So um, that's a standard introduction um, in most of our communities in Alaska. Um, family is really important, that connection, who you're related to. Um, so typically when you do your introduction, you tell who you're, where you're from, where you grew up, if it's different, and then who your parents and grandparents are. So with that said, um, I actually have my first slide is the um, um, community that I started in. This is Selawik, Alaska. It's a boardwalk community. Uh, ben was just showing me a boardwalk community for you guys, which is very different. <laughs> Um, this, uh, just a, a couple of notes, the pipe that you see is the water pipe. Um, this is built on the tundra and you, you can drive a, a or an ATV Honda. I'm not sure what you guys call them down there. Um, you can drive, a, a, an all-terrain vehicle on that boardwalk, but you wouldn't be able to drive a, a, a car. Um, so, so that kind of gives you an idea when I say boardwalk communities, we do have quite a few boardwalk communities in Alaska. There's another picture further in, um, that'll show you that. So um, this is Selawik. I um, grew up in Kotzebue. So let me see if I can get this thing to switch slides here. There you go. So Selawik is considered what we would call, um, a, a, maybe for you guys, a micro rural community. Um, it doesn't have, uh, oftentimes micro rural communities in Alaska don't, they may or may not have running water um, and sewer. And they have no opportunity for mutual aid. Um, and I'll show you in another picture here in a minute what that looks like. Um, but this community is Kotzebue. This is where I was raised. Uh, it's about a mile and a half long and maybe about three quarters of a mile wide. Um, it's the same, picture, same town, one's in winter, one's in summer. And we would consider this for our purposes, this would be like a semi-urban community. Uh, and the reason that it would be semi-urban is because they can train to the um, national minimum standard of firefighter one. They have some paid staff and they uh, have apparatus uh, such as a ladder truck, but they don't have any mutual aid. You can only get to uh, Kotzebue by airplane. So if they have a fire, they're really left on their own to take care of it for themselves. There's no road system. So the Office of Rural Fire Protection is where I work. It's under the state fire marshal. Um, I made a, a, a quick map. I pulled this image off of, of uh, Google, and then I added the red dots. So this kind of gives you an idea of the size of Alaska. A lot of people uh, really don't understand how big Alaska is. And then each of those red dots represents a community that works with my office, um, and we do a standard of training that is unique to Alaska uh, in the sense that we don't 
train to that minimum standard of firefighter one. And the reason for that is that um, we don't, most of these communities don't have the resources for that. And when I say resources, what I mean is human resources, right? There's not enough people in the community to um, have the backup and the protection that they need to be able to make entry into a building. Um, they oftentimes don't have the financial resources. Most of these communities have a zero budget. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this, like a lot of fire departments say, yeah, we don't have a budget. Um, but if you've got paid people and you've got equipment and you can maintain bunker gear and SCBAs, then you have a budget. A lot of these guys um, quite literally have no money. And if they do, it might be $10,000 a year. So uh, it, it gets really challenging when you try to have equipment and other things like that when, when that's what you have for resources. And then of course, if you don't have the financial resources, you don't have the equipment resources, but really primarily it's the human resources because if you don't have people, it doesn't matter how much money or equipment you have, if you don't have people that can do the work, right? So um, if, if you look at this map um, over where it says miles, uh, those little red dots over there, most of those communities are connected by a road system, but none of the other ones are. And when they're in line like that, because it looks like a road system, those are actually rivers. So they're, you know, they're, the communities are along uh, river banks. And so you can take boats and things to them, but but primarily you're you're having to, to fly in. And um, it's a little hard to see, but if you look down the Aleutian chain, you can see that there's a few a few more communities out that direction. To give you an idea, um, Anchorage, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Let me see if I can show this cursor. So Anchorage is right in here. It's the largest city in Alaska. It has about half of the population of the entire state. Uh, our, our state population is 700,000 approximately. And so um, about 300,000 of those people live in the Anchorage um, municipality. And then the other probably 100,000 live in the Fairbanks area and 100,000 live in the Juneau area. And then the rest of, of Alaska is spread out like this. So, so these are small, small communities. Some of these communities, there's one down in here. It has 13 people. There's a community over here um, that has no children. Um, and so, you know, it, it's just... Uh, it's really small. <laughs> um, so here's a just a quick, we were heading to one of the villages to do training. Um, this little girl was very excited about the helmet that I had. Um, but this is an example of the transportation that we're using to get in and out of mo most of these communities. Um, some of them can take uh, larger aircraft. Uh, this isn't the largest that they can handle, but this is a really typical size um, plane for getting in and out of the villages. Um, and yes, we do. It's true. We have wildlife right in our, in the same way you guys have raccoons getting into your garbage, we have black bears. Uh, the bottom picture there with the, looks like a, a city, that's Anchorage. Um, and that is real. Bears just kind of wander wherever they want. We actually had one get inside of a school once here in Anchorage. Um, the bottom picture to the left is Sitka. They had a sea lion that made its way into town and the fire department was trying to herd it out of the community with fire hoses. <laughs> they eventually had to scoop it up in a bulldozer and take it back to the shore. <laughs> um, and that is that is considered, we consider uh, Sitka like a semi-urban community. Um, and then these other pictures, you know, there, there are some villages that have roads that, that can use vehicles. Um, not all of them, but there are some that can. Otherwise, they primarily have, you know, ATVs that they drive around. Um, let's see here. So when 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 we're talking about fire training in, in these micro rural communities, I really like to use this example here uh, because it's really hard for people to kind of get their head around um, why we have why we have communities in the United States of America that are fighting fire like we did three or 400 years ago. And again, it goes back to those resources, right? But this image is really nice because most people think of firefighters as you know the modern day firefighter uh, when a lot of our villages 
are the first, you know, maybe three or four images here from, you know, the 1700s to the 1800s. Um, you know, they, there are communities that are using only buckets. They, they form a bucket brigade or they um, maybe they even have equipment, but it's the middle of winter. And so they've got to use, they just try to shovel snow or they use bulldozers to bulldoze snow. Um, and then the one that the image, the second image in from the, from the left with, with the hose, you know, you can't see what is behind that, but it's likely, you know, just some kind of a, either a manual operated pump or a, a small, you know, engine pump or something. Um, so, so this is, you know, our, this is the reality when I'm, when I'm talking about um, micro rural communities in Alaska, we're looking at about the first four people here. And the reason I say the first four is because when you get to the 1920s with the, with the gentleman that has the, the rudimentary uh, SCBA, you know, most of those villages that you saw on that map, they don't utilize SCBAs. They don't have the resources for that. Um, so even if they're doing exterior attack only, they don't have the resources for, for breathing apparatus. So let's see here. Um, so when we're doing training, we do, um, this is a typical uh, community training. They, um, they pay for us to come into the community if they have the funding to do that. Otherwise we try to find funding to get into their communities for ourselves. Um, the fire chief is in the far left corner and then um, the three that are sitting there are his firefighters that are getting the training done. And uh, the woman that's that's closest to me in the in the picture um, is a is a great grandmother, and and the reason I point this out is because we're going to talk about this a little later as I keep going through these slides, you know, for for creativity and and you know how we um, how we do our our training and how we do our um, mitigation of an emergency. Um, we're looking for everybody in the community to participate. So she actually took the whole training um, and. She was a rock star. She did a wonderful job. We have a lot of our elders in our communities that do a really good job as firefighters. Uh, so we do uh, classroom components, of course, and then we do hands-on stuff. Uh, this is a training that we did in our um, here in our urban area. We bring people in from all over the state. So these are firefighters from all different parts of Alaska that come together. We put them into teams of a maximum of six because you know, in a, in a, in a fire department, that's an urban or semi-urban department for, for you guys, you wouldn't have your entire fire department made up of six people. In our micro rural communities, we're really lucky if we have six people that are well-trained that, that are able to stay with the department for a period of a long period of time. So we break our groups up into, into six, and then we do the training with them. So, um, and the, the PPE that they're wearing, um, is pretty standard for, for the community. They don't oftentimes have any kind of um, bunker gear or wildland gear. So we encourage them to, you know, try to wear long sleeve cotton. Um, yeah, some of these guys don't have that on um, because that's they didn't have access to it. Um, but you can see they're wearing denim and jeans and some of them have rubber boots and some of them have, you know, um, just their glasses or other eye protection than hard hats and leather gloves. If they're operating the pumps, we encourage them to use ear protection. That's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. Obviously we, we want them to try and get more PPE um, and wear more PPE, but there's some challenges that come with that as far as optics for the community. If you look like a firefighter on television, you should be able to do the things a firefighter on television does. So sometimes, Wearing bunker gear, if the if the department isn't trained and the community isn't aware of what the limitations are for the fire department, uh, it can look like they should be able to make entry into a building when they really can't. Um, and and we've had communities that have had some really serious challenges with with that. Uh, let's see here. So when we do our training, we um, um, we have a, a a program that we use that's that's for Alaska. We, um, we use the NFPA 1001, 1035, 1021. There's a, a number of them that we use. We've taken parts of them out so that we can implement them with, um, with the capabilities of the communities. But certain definitions are really hard to cross over. For instance, when we talk about, you know, um, 
forcible entry. If you look at NFPA 1001 and you look at what it says about forcible entry, it's very clear that you need to have all of your gear because you're actually going inside of a building that's on fire. For us, when we talk about forcible entry in our training, we're talking about entry with the fire stream. So um, yes, we need to force open um, a building, but it's because we need to get the water inside, not because we're gonna put people inside. And so that definition um, for NFPA and for what we're doing doesn't really cross over. It's, it's the same goes with PPE. It doesn't really cross over very well. So we, we do our best to, to frame the, the training um, based off of, of, of those standards with the understanding that um, we're doing exterior only, defensive tactics, mitigation style suppression. And then a lot of the rest of the training, uh, actually a pretty large portion of the training then goes into like this image where we're doing community planning, we're doing all of our um, pre-incident stuff, we're doing lots of prevention work, lots of hazard mitigation, uh, because if they have a fire, it's going to be devastating. You know, the, the capabilities of the community are just not, not going to be able to, to really um, make the effect that we would like to see. So one of the issues that we that we have, um, so when we talk about doing you know exterior only um, defensive tactics, one of the things that we really focus on is preventing exposures. A lot of our communities are similar to this. These are three different communities in three different parts of Alaska. You can see that the homes are really close together. Um, they're oftentimes surrounded by water, trees, or mountains, and so if if a fire you know gets beyond the 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 first home, it can easily take out a considerable amount of the community. So um, in, in many cases, you know, we think of firefighting and the public thinks of firefighting as, you know, if my home catches on fire, the fire department is going to save my children, myself, and my property, where a lot of times in our villages, the fire department isn't going to be able to do that because they don't have the resources for it. So they've got to try to save other people's property, other people's um, families. And, and that's one of those things where forcible entry comes in again. We might, we might be using forcible entry quite a bit, but not because we're using it on the building that's on fire. We may be using it on the exposures to get people out or to try and save possessions of an exposure that we know we're not going to be able to prevent. Um, so so th that's, you know, for definitions and stuff, that's a little different uh, for urban communities or semi-urban communities versus what we're doing in our villages. This is a picture of uh, Hooper Bay. Hooper Bay is a community that um, we had training uh, about two weeks later. So when we do our training, it's 40 hours and we take someone who knows absolutely nothing about the fire service, has never been involved in the fire service in any way, shape or form. And in that 40 hours, we may be taking someone from that position all the way up to incident command because they may be, when we're done, they may be the most trained person in the community. And that's what happened with Hooper Bay. So we had been in there, uh, done our training. And then a couple of weeks later, the school caught on fire and this was their very first fire. Um, by the time they actually, it happened in the evening, you know, throughout the night, it started to burn. And by the time they found it, it was, it was, you know, pretty much out of control. So, you know, they, they did what they were taught to do. They, they identified the most important components of the community, which they had done during training, which was their tank farm because winter was going to be coming and they had to have fuel to, to keep warm. So they identified their most important assets, protected those assets, half of the village burned to the ground. Not one person got hurt, not one. It was a tremendous loss, but with the resources they had, they knew that they weren't going to be able to stop it. They just had to create barriers and prevent it from getting, um, you know, getting the entire community or getting that tank farm. So, so when we when we use this as an example, yes, half of the community burned down, but not because of failure. Half of the community burned down because they maxed out their resources and they did their best and they, they saved their tank farm and they saved half of their village. Um, it was a, it was a lot, it was very devastating for the community. I'm, I'm not trying to downplay it. Uh, but this is one of the reasons that we, 
you know, spend the amount of time that we do training and trying to, you know, teach them what their capacity is and what they can actually affect change on. Hey, Lisa. Yes. Got a quick question for you. And this just reminds me, um, I know a, a group that you definitely uh, wholeheartedly acknowledged at the last Alaska State Fire Conference, and they certainly were, you know, well do that acknowledgement was the rural fire chiefs. And just looking at this, and you had mentioned uh, in our previous conversations that, again, you might take people who have no requisite knowledge of the fire service that most of us are, are accustomed to, and you're giving them such a weighty responsibility and also having them evaluate their capabilities and limitations. And more often than not, when you showed, for example, that picture of the four, four to six people in the community who were the trained fire officials, they have to uh, take every civilian, like you said, if it's a fire in these villages, it's a community event. Everybody's showing up. It's not going to be on the morning news and somebody surprisingly says, oh, wow, I didn't hear about the school burning down last night. So people are showing up and these fire, these fire officials, especially the rural fire chiefs, are going to have to take civilians and employ them in roles, either like you had said, you're not a hot zone role, but you know, in, in different roles and functions. And all of us, uh, you know, myself, Ben, Bobby, we've all been in those situations, even working for more urban departments where we've gotten on the scene, had a big snot sling and building fire. And we're very shorthanded at first to the point where you're getting a police officer or even a civilian or you know, some off-duty firefighter who might be somewhere to drag a hose line for you just to a hydrant. Well, that might be a, a handful of times in our career. And in these villages, they call that Tuesday. So would you, would you mind speaking to that a little bit? Just the you know, immense responsibility and just you know, phenomenal job that these rural fire chiefs and uh, departments do. Yeah. So thank you for, for reminding me of that. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, when your community, when your community is, 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 is that big, right. You're, you're, you're going to know when something is happening and, and, you know, in our, in our villages, it's people, are, a lot of people are related to each other. You know, if, if someone's home is on fire, um, when you've got 300 people in the village, it's going to either be a relative or it's going to be a friend somebody that you know and that you care about. So, um, yeah, so, so coming together to, 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 to mitigate that, um, we actually have, um, we have quite a few times where, you know, you've got teenagers that are showing up on scene and they get direction on how they're, they're going to help. Um, we, we are very, we spend a lot of time talking about the hot zone versus the warm zone versus the cold zone and where you can put civilians. Um, people are, are just going to help. You, you can't really tell them no. And unlike what you guys have, if you've got a civilian who's absolutely insistent on helping and it's dangerous and you can't have this happen, you can have a law enforcement officer remove them from the area. Um, most of the villages that, um, that we serve don't have law enforcement, period. There are no cops. So if you've got someone in the community that wants to take action, you've got to be able to figure out a way to put them to use. So part of our pre-planning, part of the conversation during training is how do we do that? What are all the jobs that we can identify that need to happen on scene that we can give a layperson and have them be productive and not cause you know, harm? So some of the examples I use when I'm working with a, a community to start a fire department, I probably should have told you. so. So my job is pretty much to help people with no, no fire experience go from no fire department in their community to having a fire department and being able to do suppression and all the stuff in between that, primarily and most importantly, education and prevention. So it's kind of this cradle, I don't want to say to grave, but in, in a lot of our communities, the fire department can be active for a while and then stop then they don't have a fire department again. Then they have a fire department and then they don't have a fire department. Um, and that's because they're relying completely on, for the most part, completely on volunteers. And it's a lot of work and it's a lot of politics and it's, it's really challenging and there's liability involved and all those other things. So, um, so, you know, people can put their energy into it and sometimes they, they have to step back. So they'll lose a fire department and have to start over again. 
Um, and we, we have someone within the fire marshal's office that helps with all the paperwork for that. But as far as, you know, motivating people and, and kind of selling insurance or being the cheerleader, that's, that's what I do. Um, and so, yeah, so, so a lot of that conversation is, all right, so you've got, uh, how do you get your elders involved? Well, if you've got young people that need to respond to an incident, who's going to care for the children if they, if they suddenly have to leave? So then they actually become a part of your fire department. But the role that they play is child care provider. The role that they play is bringing, you know, um, um, really high nutrient traditional foods to the scene so that they can eat a couple of pieces of whale and continue on with their with their firefighting, right? So that, that they're doing rehab because we don't have ambulance and EMS that's doing rehab for people when they're fighting fires. Um, you know, a lot of times communities utilize their teenagers to do perimeter control. So they keep the children away from the scene and out of the hazard zone. Um, or they'll have the teenagers haul hose. Um, or they'll have them roll the hose and put it all away and help with all the cleanup and everything. Um, so there's lots of different, you know, ways and, and things. We, um, <laughs> we encourage people to have their... Um, the, the community member, it's typically a woman, um, that knows everyone and knows everything that's happening in the entire village. Uh, we, we encourage that person to become your communications person, to log everything that happens. So in a lot of the villages, they have a, a VHF radio um, and they actually talk on that radio and the whole community hears it. Um, they've got telephones, but they'll do all their announcements and stuff over this radio. You know, so if they're going to be doing any kind of communication on scene or if they're going to be responding to an incident, they're probably going to be using this public radio system. And so then we encourage because they don't have a dispatch center, they don't have communications or anything. So we encourage, you know, them to find that person and their job is to just write down everything that's happening. Who says that they're showing up? You know, who who called it in? When did it start? You know, when did they say they finished taking care of the fire? They might actually leave home and actually sit outside of the fire and just take notes on the things that they see that are happening. So, you know, these are, these are jobs that, that you really do during your quiet time. You do that during, you know, calm. And so then when something happens, everyone picks up and, and, and plays their, their part. So we, we think outside the box quite a bit in, in, in the, in our communities and, you know, people think that someone who has a handicap or who's an elder or something, you know, they're not fit for duty, but they are. Everyone is fit for duty. You just have to find the right task for them to perform and they can do the work. Um, it takes a little effort and it takes a lot of thinking outside the box, but everybody can participate in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa, I had a question for you. I, you know, um, when you were educating Trevor and I on, on Alaskan culture and things like that, I think one of the things that you talked about a lot was um, the, the people that lived in the harshest climates and the smallest villages um, really relied on each other uh, to stay alive uh, through the winter time, the long yeah. winters up there and things like that. And you even mentioned about the warriors in the south down by the Ketchikan area and things like that. Um, so I don't, I, I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about the, the fabric of the community, because though you're teaching them a, as a community, the fire safety and, and, and how to control spreads of fires, uh, these communities up there, because of the way they work together to survive, um, I, I don't think maybe the, us in the lower 48 really do understand how communities in the most harsh environments up in Alaska work. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that integrates into how you bring in the fire prevention? Because they're really a community that, that they're communities that are really there to, to, to keep themselves alive, to keep themselves surviving. And, and, and so you're part of this is part of that, which is, is very different than the lower 48 where you have just unlimited resources. It may be 20 minutes away or 30 minutes away or down a highway or down a road somewhere. But, you know, up there, there's no roads, there's no access, there's no anything and in the harsh environments. There's even less. So can you just talk about small Alaskan communities, the most harsh environments and and, and how they live and how they live through the winters and summers and then how that integrates in with your fire training a little bit. Yeah. So, um, so you're right. And, and what, you know, a, a little bit about, about me just for a second. Um, 
you know, I moved to, to Selawick right immediately after I was born. Um, my parents moved to Selawick and we were, um, you know, adopted into the community. And you can, you know, I don't know if you can tell by my face, but I am a Western person. But my culture and my, um, the history that I know to be true is Inuit. And um, I have a lot of my uh, adopted family from home that are very clear with me that you are an Inuit woman. We have adopted you. You are ours. You, you are, you have the culture you, you, um, you know, cherish the language, you cherish our traditions, you know, you honor us, you're a part of us. And the, all of the different uh, First Nations peoples are separate peoples. They're different people. You know, they have, um, we have kind of five major groups of, of First Nations people here in Alaska. And, um, and, and, and they approach things a little bit differently. Where I'm from in the Northwest Arctic, um, it's it's very common for a community to really embrace people and bring them into the fold. Um, sharing and um, taking care of one another is a primary foundational value. And so, um, you know, doing community work, you know, having a, a mentality of we together do something we, when we do it together, do it better. Um, that was a survival tactic from day one, from the very beginning. Because if you were completely on your own in those harsh environments, you were not going to be able to survive. You needed to have that community. And so the community really relies on each other to, to, to take care of each other and to, to, um, to provide the necessities. Um, one of the, the, the challenges that we face in any of our communities where we have an indigenous population that has been colonized is the idea that we're coming in from the outside to solve your problems and to teach you how to do things because you don't know because you're ignorant that is absolutely not the case you know our first nations people are not ignorant and because they live a traditional lifestyle or a um, modern combination traditional lifestyle doesn't mean that they know less or that they don't know how to take care of themselves. So when when we go into a community, we very much um, are looking for that collaborative effort, not because we're going to fix things or we're going to solve a problem, but because we want to see how it is that they've taken care of themselves for thousands of years and that we can we can twist something a little bit to make it fit with some of the modern technologies that have come into the community that have made things in the fire service hazards, right? And and how do we how do we bridge that without um, coming in like we know all the answers? Because if my parents had moved to Selawick and not been adopted by the community, I don't know that we would have been able to survive it. You know, my dad had to learn to hunt. My mom had to learn how to pack water. <laughs> You know, we we had to we had to learn from the people that that took us in as their own. So that collective effort is is a fundamental component of of our communities. It's 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 not I am doing something. It's we are doing something. Does that does that touch on what you were 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 wanting? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's very interesting and, and i still remember some of the lessons you taught me as i as i think now um you know i, I think one of the things i recently i've taken up doing like, like trying to learn how to do photography and i just always remember your your story about your mother and and, and that that in hunting in alaska animals present themselves mm. and so i think about that when i'm trying to get that particular picture or shot of a bird or something i think uh, if i don't get it i said well it didn't present itself and so, oh that's uh, really neat yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, so the story that he's and actually I have a picture of her in here. Um, but but the, the story that you're referring to is that, you know, if, if you know, we really believe that that the animals allow themselves to be taken to, to sustain the, the humans that are taking them, you know, and, and the example that I like to use is, do you really think that, you know, eight or 10 people in a skin boat would be able to take down a whale if that whale didn't want to be taken? So 
you know, um, that respect and that collectiveness, not only for each other, but for, for, the, for the rest of the, the resources that we have and that we use, that's vital. You know, um, and when, when you circle that back to fire, that's part of, that's part of the conversation. You know, without heat, without flame, our peoples in Alaska wouldn't have survived. You know, it's, it's a harsh climate. And so the respect for fire, and, and this really does cross all of it, right? I mean, we wouldn't be the humanity that we are now if we hadn't figured out how to eat, cook food. Um, so, you know, but that core respect for fire and understanding that it is, it should be hard to get um, and it should be respected in the way that you respect the land and the animals and and the rest of your community, right? It's it's that vital component. It's not just something that you turn off and on um, in the kitchen, or you flip a switch and you've got a fireplace, you know, that's burning some ambiance. You know, this is fire because if if our wood stove is not burning properly, we're not going to survive the winter. So. Hey, uh, I mean, I got uh, another question for you that kind of dovetails into Bobby's and you had mentioned, you know, obviously people have to get along despite their differences in these communities for survival and you know, the Smiths and the Joneses, they could have a decades long personal rift with each other, but that all gets put aside when it comes time to you know, work for the betterment mm -hmm. of that particular village or community. And looking at the sheer size and scope of Alaska, which I know some people literally think that Alaska and Hawaii are probably a couple <laughs> hundred miles apart on the map and why is one so hot, one so cold, but just the sheer size and scope, there has to be like in most places in the United States, a lot of maybe regionalism or anything else. And I, I noticed the, the uniform that you're wearing, uh, some people might not recognize that as, as an actual uniform, but how, how, do, how do you as a trainer establish trust in these communities? Like you said, they're very accepting of people from the outside, but like one of the basic tenants like myself and Bobby and Ben have always had, when we go somewhere to uh, do a class or a course, we don't come in with the idea um, that people are any less or that we're there to teach or instruct. We're there to share some experiences and pass along some things that we've benefited from over the years. So how do you establish that trust in these communities when you're coming in to all different areas of the state um, and you're not coming in as, you know, oh, here's here's this big fire official from the state telling us how to run our lives and and, and do firefighting in these communities. So how, how do you establish that rapport and that trust? And if you don't mind yeah. talking about your uh, uniform um, as well, please. So, so for me, it's a little bit easier because I grew up in an Inuit community. And so some of the you know, the language, um, even though we have a diversified language uh, across the state with our First Nations peoples, um, there is that core component with, you know, knowing some words and being willing to learn words and then using them. Excuse me, knowing our traditional values across the state is also really helpful. And so um, being able to tap into those traditional values when you're having conversations and, and you know, just um, building a rapport, you know, for, for me, I know that nicknames are really important. Um, and so nicknames are, are pretty common, you know, the, they, they, you know, they're, they're established quickly and then they're used. Um, for example, <laughs> um, I'll oftentimes, you know, my fire chiefs that I start working with, you know, I'll call them hun or babe, you know, uh, where other places that might be considered something, you know, absolutely unacceptable, you wouldn't say that to someone. But when when you're building that rapport with uh, someone from one of our small communities, that's a that's a term of endearment. It 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 doesn't have the same connotation that it does in our Western culture. Um, you know, being able to laugh and joke and do a little bit of self-deprecation and and you know um, be silly and and understand where. Um, the trigger points are for some of the pain that our communities have sustained. Um, that stuff is all important too. So you'll notice on this, um, that what I'm wearing right now is something that um, my brother and I learned how to sew so that we could create a uniform that was uh, more culturally appropriate for our, our communities. And so this is, uh, I guess I'll stand up here again. 
see if I can get it in the picture. My kind of back up here. So this is called a kaspak or an atikluk. It has a hood on the back. This is a traditional shirt or jacket that's worn um, on the coastal part of Alaska. So from the north all the way down to the, um, the Aleutian Islands. This is, um, women typically have them really colorful and have a skirt. Um, the men oftentimes have a solid color. You'll notice there's no patch, Maltese cross, nothing on it. Um, and the reason for that is that um, you know, during colonization and during um, this assimilation process into, you know, the indigenous cultures into America, um, the badge had, uh, there was a lot of negativity associated with the badge. Um, not only law enforcement, but also when it came time for hunting. So if, um, you know, one of my elders was telling a story about how when he was a child, they went hunting, they got the goose, they got a couple of them, and then they were bringing them home to eat them. And this man showed up with his big shiny badge and took them away and took away his father's gun. Now, to put that into perspective, that would be like you taking your children to Costco with your debit card, but you didn't go shopping on the right day. You went on Friday, but you were supposed to go on Wednesday. So law enforcement comes in they not only take away your debit card, so you can't go and get more, right? They took away his gun, but they also take all the groceries away. And you as a man or a woman now have this child who knows that your pantry is empty. You needed to go Costco shopping. You needed to have all that food, but now the food is gone and the debit card is gone. So you have no access to any money to go back to a store because you went shopping on the wrong day. So that happened, you know, when they established these hunting seasons and our elders didn't understand we've been, you know, these animals have been giving themselves to us in this cycle, all, all of these generations. And suddenly this person comes in with this badge and takes this away. And this elder that was telling the story, you know, he was probably in his mid 80s early nineties and he's welling up with tears because of the humiliation to his father and the fact that they had no food, right? They couldn't go hunting when they were supposed to go hunting. So a, the badge is not just a law enforcement thing. It's, it's, it's that, it's that, it's that connection to, to food and to safety and all those things. And so, so a lot of times there's sort of a negative, connotation to that. So, so our uniforms, when we go into a village, we don't have any kind of badge. We do have t-shirts that we wear underneath that have a Maltese cross um, that say um, Alaska fire, fire training, rural Alaska fire training. Um, and they just have the state of Alaska on it. Um, and once we build a rapport, we take off these, these jackets and we can have that t-shirt with that Maltese cross. But we don't have white polos with badges and all kinds of other fancy stuff when we're in a village. And you know, there's kind of this this other side of it where people are saying, well, we need to we need to allow um, this understanding that you can be wearing a badge and you can still have build a rapport. But I, we don't have a whole lot of opportunities when we're getting in into a village. We don't get to go there often. We don't get to be with our communities that often. So if we've got one chance in ten years, they can learn to trust a badge somewhere else. Like we need to we need to build that rapport. We need to be able to eat the food need to eat beluga stew. We need to eat whale. We need to be able to eat the different fish that they give us. Um, we need to be able to sleep on the floor and not complain when there's no running water for five or six days when we're in a village and we're having to, you know, use, we call it a honey bucket. It's basically a bucket that you go to the bathroom in. You don't yeah, we got it. <laughs> we have to be able to go into a community and just be okay with that without ever making it feel like this is beneath us, you know, or the work that they're doing or the fact that they don't have a fire station, you know, that they don't have certain things. That's all perfectly fine. In my opinion, these communities are kicking ass because they are doing this hard work with not a lot of resources, not a lot of money or people or equipment, 
and they're doing good work. Yes, we have a lot of fatalities in rural Alaska when you compare it to urban Alaska and the rest of the United States. We have four times more fatalities, but that's because we need to be able to get out there and do more. And, you know, you have to have the finances to back that up. And when the community doesn't have the finances, it's pretty hard to do. Um, so let me just get through the rest of these slides really quick, just so you show you these pictures and then we can continue having a few more um, conversations. Let me see if I can get there. So here's a, here's um, a couple of communities. Uh, I think that I show you this one already because I skipped back and forth. I think I did. Yeah. Um, I want to yes. point out in this picture, you'll see another picture of this, but the, the largest image that you see is a, is a, is a community called Kibalina and that white round tank in the middle of town is their water. This is a dry community. They have no running water. So they haul water from that water tank in 55 gallon garbage um, cans or five gallon buckets or things like that. They, they carry it home and then utilize it at home. Um, and then you can see they've got a fuel tank farm um, right up at the front of the village and they're surrounded by ocean. That's all salt water. So in, when, in a community like this, if it's winter time, they've got to drill through with an ice auger. They've got to drill through sometimes four to six feet of ice to be able to get to that salt water to get um, water out to pump it. Um, this is called an Arctic hydrant. This, uh, wa this is a water line that sits on top of the tundra. There's some insulation. This is the fire chief of, um, of uh, NOAAC. And um, he, he pulled the insulation out to show us this hydrant. So they just um, attach their hose to that and they tap right into it. A lot of people even in Alaska have never seen an Arctic hydrant. This is not a joke, this is real. This is again, the same community. They have their, um, their nine horsepower pump in the back of that trailer with all their fire hose. Uh, they borrowed this Honda from one of their firefighters to be able to transport this cart. This is their response equipment, period. This is all of it. Uh, these guys are lucky enough to have old uh, bunker gear. The bunker gear tags inside it because we looked at all this stuff is from 1976. So they've got to be really careful about optics for their community because it looks like they can go inside of a building when they actually can't. Um, but this community, the older gentleman with the white helmet is the fire chief. He's been the fire chief for a really long time and he's very good about um, keeping his community informed on what the capacity is of their fire department, what they can and can't do. This is a typical, um, we call it a firehouse in a box. This is like a Connex or a container van. It's really short, maybe 15 or 20 feet. And the trailers inside of them uh, have their apparatus like their pumps or their Trimax 30. You can see in the back hanging up are the ice augers so that they can get down through the ice. And then they have to keep this heated so that nothing freezes. So this is one of those trailers opened up. This is, uh, this is the crew. My trainer is standing here in the front with the blue baseball hat and the, and the blue um, sweater. And um, you can see that we've got suction hose, we've got the fire hose, we've got a nine horsepower pump, and that is the meat and potatoes of this fire department for their apparatus. If you look in the background there, you can see that water tank and all the kids that are huddled around. Um, they were playing in the, in the street, that's the street, by the way, we're actually in the middle of the street right here doing our training. Um, when we talk about, um, you know, mitigating um, a fire and actually, you know, doing suppression work, this is an example, You, I don't know if you can see it clearly enough, but there's actually a piece of apparatus up in the front left-hand corner of this picture. This is um, way up north, they actually have apparatus, they've got a lot of money from oil um, they had a, a school catch on fire um, and it, you can't quite see it, but on the far left is, and this is, by the way, this picture was taken in the middle of the day. Um, this is um, daytime right now, probably around noon, uh, 11, 11 in the morning, noon, noonish. Um, and it's, it's far enough north that the sun didn't rise, but that's teacher housing over there um, on the far left. And because they weren't able to stop this fire, because even though they had apparatus, the, um, the equipment froze as they were trying to, to, to push water through it. 
they actually took a bulldozer and and um, bulldozed the the hallway that connected the main part of the school into the teacher housing. So they were able to save the housing with a bulldozer. We actually have quite a few examples of of fire chiefs um, utilizing a bulldozer to um, to mitigate a fire because they don't have the resources for water. Uh, this is one of those nine horsepower pumps. This is during training. He was uh, teaching this gentleman in the khaki pants how to uh, to, to run this pump. We've got a pumpkin behind us. Uh, some communities will use pumpkins. Most of the time they'll draft right out of a lake or a river. Um, this is one of the villages that we were in. You can see that we've got our, our, our trainer is actually in the far back. He's giving instruction. The other person with the white helmet is one of our assistant trainers who lives in the community. And the other two are learning um, and you know, even though the the pressure coming out of these hoses might max out at 90 psi, we still teach them to use two people on the hose. the The challenge is is that if if you've got two hose lines going, you know, you've got a primary and an attack line, a primary attack line and a backup line. If you've got two people on each of those, and you've only got four or five people that can respond, and you've got one person making sure the water is actually going through that hose, you don't have a whole lot of people left over. So um, so oftentimes there'll be only one person on that hose. Um, here's a here's a picture of them setting up the pump in the river, um, and you know they use baskets and stuff so they don't collect rocks when they're doing it. Um, this this woman who's rolling the hose here, she's a, a great great grandmother, um, and she you know was down there rolling hoses. I, I I love this picture. You've got the you've got this the snow go in the back there in the left corner. And then you've got the the caribou antlers on the dog house, and um, this is just a really, really pretty typical scene. I, I thought it was sweet. Um, this is an image of, of of washing hoses. This is time to clean up from training. Uh, they're washing it in the river. You can see that the gentleman in the background is wearing the same uniform that I'm wearing. He's my instructor, and the person in the foreground is one of their primary firefighters with his very large beard. It goes down to his chest um, because you can be a firefighter and have a beard like that when you're not using an SCBA. Um, so we spend, uh, I know we're running out of time. We spend most of our time um, doing public education. Uh, this was an example of one of our firefighters who um, teaches people in the community. He actually will make these for them um, so that their lighters and matches are not accessible to children. When we do public education, um, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff. The reason I have these little girls here is because when we went into this village, they um, picked me flowers and then took me to all of their homes and to their cousins' homes and to their grandmother's homes so that I could make sure that they were fire safe. So these little girls, these tiny, tiny little girls became the uh, public education advocates for this community. Um, and then the, the two people behind me um, actually are my relatives and um, you know, I went, I went and talked to them, told them what we were doing and then asked them to help us. They didn't come to the training, but they went door to door and told people that we were doing a public education event later in the, in the week. And they, they did all of my, um, announcements for me, um, even though they weren't able to come to the training. So, um, the, when we talk about doing outreach, oftentimes in our communities, it's, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's a lot of helping your elders, you know, going in and actually just being with them, helping them do simple tasks, building that trust, and then actually doing stuff when it comes to fire mitigation. Lots of just one-on-one -on -one conversation anytime you have the opportunity to do it. Um, this is actually my grandmother. She um, was showing me that she sets a timer every time she cooks. She is 89 years old um, and she still does a lot of cooking. So she was showing me that she sets a timer when she cooks because she might forget. This is not something she was taught by anyone. This is something she does on her own, which is really nice because we advocate for this. Uh, so she let me take her picture. This is the same uh, woman who, who told me that, um, that uh, she was kind of scolding the boys in the family because we were cutting up caribou and, she, and it was kind of smelly. And she goes, those boys, they chased it. They just want to... They just want to ride their Hondas fast and chase them. And, and they made it the meat stinky because they chased it. You know, they didn't let it give itself up. <laughs> um, so I, I guess, you know, the, the last picture that I have here, um, this is in, in one of our communities. 
you know, a lot of times you'll hear someone when they say, you know, you, we've got a really, we've got a lot of work that needs to be done. They're talking about a project. They're talking about community risk reduction. They're talking about whatever. And they say, how do you eat an elephant? And the response is one bite at a time. But I always say, wait, 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 time out. We live in Alaska. We don't eat elephants. We eat whales. And we don't eat whales one bite at a time. We eat whales with the community. Everyone eats the whale. And so when you're looking at your fire department, when you're looking at recruitment, when you're looking at public education, when you're looking at community risk reduction, when you're looking at suppression, you know, parts of your suppression, you know, tactics, if you, if you look at, at that and you go, how can I make it so that every single person in the community can have a part to play in all these different areas, then it's easy to eat the whale. And you don't have to pay everybody to do that because if you find what they're passionate about and you give them the tools, you can take someone and you can teach them about fire stuff. We do it all the time here in Alaska, all the time. What you can't do is teach someone to have passion or commitment or a sense of community that can't be taught. That's something that people have and you can find those people and make that happen. Some of the examples that I thought of when I was thinking about the urban side of things, because you know, I live in these two worlds, right? I live in the in the in the rural, micro rural world and I live in the urban world. So, you know, how do you do that? How do you translate something from this tiny little micro community into a larger community? You do it by by thinking outside the box. Well, so we've got a senior home. We've got, you know, homes that have senior senior citizens. Find a senior citizen that needs to have that job and teach them to be the, and I'm putting this in air quotes, fire marshal of that home. They will educate their elders and their peers within that home. You give them those resources and let them do their work. Teach them how to do that work. Give them purpose. People need to be needed. They want to be wanted. And the fire department can do that. You can do it in developmentally disabled homes. If you have, um, you know, assisted living homes for, for um, not for elders, but for people that have disabilities, you can do that same thing. You can work with the staff to find residents that have the, the capacity, the functioning capacity to do this kind of work, to check alarms and to, to talk about fire safety and all these other things with the people that live there. If you've got already established youth programs, Having youth get involved in doing some of this outreach and prevention work is really great because then you bridge the gap between the youth and especially our vulnerable elders. If you've got cultural um, communities within your community, find people that are within that culture that already speak the language of the people that you're trying to reach, right? They already know the culture, they already know the language and, and make them um, an asset to you. Um, and church groups, um, Rotary clubs, Lions clubs, 4-H, any of these already established um, groups of people, you can find someone within that group that you empower them with fire prevention messaging and let them do their work and make them honorary members of your department. Figure out ways to, to um, lobby your authority that has jurisdiction over you to allow this kind of thinking outside the box and utilizing all these different talents that people have. Um, you know, we have a, we have a couple in, in one of our communities that's on the road system. Um, and I was talking to her, she's the assistant chief, her husband is the chief. And, you know, we were talking just the other day and she was telling me some of the challenges that, that they face, but this couple is so determined. They are so dedicated to creating a fire department from nothing. Um, and, and they're doing really good work. And, and part of what they're having to do is really think outside the box and how they're going to get people in the community to, to participate in ways that they hadn't thought of participating in the past. If you say that you have to be a firefighter to be on the fire department, people will turn the other way because they have a stereotype of what a firefighter is. And that's just not, that's not true. You know, we are all, we can all be fire protection specialists. Uh, we just need to teach someone, we just need to teach people how to do that. So that that's kind of all I had for my spiel. I, I don't know how much time we have or if you guys have other questions. I, I thought that was great. I, and I think one of the things that, um, I'm going to switch back so the four of us are a little bit bigger now. 
Um, one of the things that, that you kind of reiterated throughout the, the whole uh, presentation and talk and uh, even through our questions was um, something that, that we talked about last night, something that we talked about during our phone conversation. Um, it's all about we. Everything in Alaska is all about we. It's about the community. It's about making sure everything, everybody else is safe and has what they need to, to get through the winters that they have, you know, that, that they're, every, the community is taken care of. Um, and, and I know talking to, to Bobby and Trevor, when we were talking about, Hey, what are we going to do for, for this present or for this, with this webcast? Um, and then the talk was, Hey, we should, you know, there was a, a gentleman from Alaska that we were going to try and, and get up with, um, and it never worked out. And we, we were fortunate enough to get Lisa. Um, but you know, I, I, we, we wanted to talk about doing more with less, which you can't do any more with any less in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And Bobby's comment at the time was that's, that's the fire service in Alaska. Like you take, you bore the fire service down to the, to the nuts and bolts. And it is always about doing more with less. You know, they want you to run more calls. Sorry, we can't give you more staffing. We can't afford it. They want you to, to do more pub ed and more risk reduction and get out in the community more. Sorry, we don't have the money for more staffing. Your, your apparatus, your fire engine is broke. If you've got a fire engine, you know, um, but we need you to do all these things. And, and you know, a majority of the time, the fire, the firefighters and, and the people that are out there doing it, they're like, we got you. We're on it. We're going to take care of it because that's what the fire service is about. It's about the community. It's about taking care of each other. That's the brotherhood, the sisterhood, the whole thing. You know, again, from soup to nuts, from start to finish, from from when we started at seven to now to the start of the fire service through the through the end of our time and all of it. It's always about we. It's about the community. It's about each other, and I, like I, I'm getting chills right now just thinking about the whole thing. Um, you know, I, it, it's amazing. It's it's so cool. I told Trevor last night when we got done with our trial that if, if Strike the Box ever goes back to Alaska, I, I'm calling my boss at school. Hey, boss, I'm not coming in for these these this week. I'm going to Alaska. Like it. Like I I I want to go. I've heard nothing but great things from Bobby and Trevor when they were up there and talking to Bobby a little bit more because he stayed a little longer. Um, but it's like, it, it's something that I think that we need to experience to understand that, Hey, look, you guys are going out into these micro rural communities and you're, you're doing it. You're teaching people how to, to be safe, to do the right thing, to, to effectively manage and mitigate incidents when, you know, we're, we're in these rural or I'm sorry, we're in these urban settings and we're bitching and complaining that <laughs> we don't have the money. We, you know, we, like you said at the beginning, you know, you talk about the, the career departments and I'm not, not picking volunteer career. You know, we don't have money for staffing. Well, yes, you do because one, you have a job. So like, you can't say that you don't have a budget, like stop bitching, do your job, do it well because there are people that literally have zero money to spend on anything in the fire service and they are doing it. And it's it just like it, when you start thinking about stuff, like that's what it's about. Like, how can we, this is the hand we're dealt. How are we going to make that work? And I, that again, it all goes back to the we. So sorry, that's my show. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate those comments. And, and, you know, I just, you know, I, I feel the need to just, you know, kind of, kind of qualify some of some of what I'm saying, and and these communities are very small. You know, they don't do. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but most of them, if not all, do not do EMS. Mm -hmm. um, so in Alaska, in these small communities, in the urban and semi-urban communities, fire and EMS are connected like they are for you guys. Um, in most of the the villages and the communities that I serve. Fire and search and rescue are connected, right? Because people are leaving by boat and by snow goes and by everything else to get from one point to another. And so search and rescue is a really important component. I guess what I'm saying is that when you have a larger community and the expectation of that community is here, you have to have a certain level of funding to meet that expectation. You just do. 
Um, when you have a community that understands that they don't have the resources and, and the expectation is here and you don't have the finances to do it, the goal is still the same. Whether you have resources up here and, and money and, and not enough money to maintain that, or you're down here and you're trying to do that same amount of prevention and protection, but with a very different limited amount of resources, you're only going to have a certain capacity. The expectation from the community needs to match what the what the reality is of, of your fire department. So I guess I say that because I don't I absolutely do not downplay the fact that our larger urban and semi-urban communities have a budget, but they need they need to have a maintain a certain level for their budget. I guess for me, when when you get really kind of sucked into this idea of you've got the money, you have the money to be able to do the work, you stop thinking about what if we had no money? How would we do the same thing? Who would we have to ask to come together? Who would we have to tap in for talent? You know, all these things, you know, we get very laser focused on the suppression component of the fire department. But if we have to do suppression, we failed. Mm -hmm. We we either failed in the prevention piece or we failed in the education of, of, of being able to do your own suppression during the incipient phase of that fire. You know, fire extinguishers, baking soda, pot lids, all those things where, yes, that fire starts, but you're able to get it while it's really tiny. You know, if we're not doing that level of education for our community and we have to show up, things are already bad. You know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a failure point. I can say that pretty easily because the communities that I'm working with, it really is. And because of their resources, they aren't going to be able to save, you know, keep it to room and contents, right? They're probably very likely going to lose the entire structure, if not more, right? Half the village. Mm -hmm. when, when the expectation in the larger department is that we will put that out, we will save the people inside, the focus goes on being able to do that as opposed to being able to stop it from ever happening in the beginning. And to be frank, you know, the fire service attracts oftentimes people that want to be able to have that adrenaline. They want to be able to do that kind of work. Um, it's not as thrilling or exciting to stop something that never happened and being able to qualify something that never happened. You know, for me, I really like to focus on the saves. We don't talk about the saves. We don't talk about there was a fire that started on the stove and it stopped before the fire department ever had to come. That is a save for us. That's a success for us. We need to glorify that success. We need to be shouting that from the rooftops. This homeowner stopped this fire with baking soda and a pot lid, right? Not the fire department came and saved it to room and contents because that's still room and contents. And for us, we don't, most of our folks don't have insurance. They have no hotel to stay at. There's no, yeah, we have Red Cross. They do what they can, but they can't really put them up in a hotel. There's no hotel in the village. You know, where are they going to go? Mm -hmm. So, you know, even just a room and contents fire in one of our small communities can be really devastating and, and, and you know, put people out, not just in the, in the home, but the entire community then gets put out by that. You know, it becomes a becomes a challenge for the whole community. So I, I, I think, you know, I'm hoping that if anybody gets anything from this conversation, it's, um, wow, I'm really lucky in my department, and I'm I'm really blessed to have all of the resources that I have and the human resources that I have and the talent out there. So hopefully that's what happens. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so we're we're a little over an hour. So we'll have uh, Bobby. Bobby got booted that that Millville internet. Hey man, <laughs> Alaska internet is kicking your butt. I was gonna say, hey, you're, we're <laughs> getting beat out by Alaska internet. <laughs> um. So hey, Bobby, we're uh, we're just finishing. Um, and thought we'd go ahead and start wrapping up. So, uh, you want to go ahead and go first and. And your final thoughts? Sure. Um, first, I, I guess, Lisa, are you from Hawaii? Because I saw Ben wear a Hawaiian shirt, so I wasn't sure if he got the memo or how it all worked out. But um, I, I got confused. 
<laughs> I know we we did Hawaiian shirts last week. I'm yeah, still I'm yeah, yeah yeah the Hawaiian shirts for the Alaska show. That's good. All right. So uh, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, Lisa, you could spend hours talking to her. She is a wonderful person um, and just a perfect um, diplomat for Alaska. Um, Trevor asked me to go up there and teach, and I thought, gosh, I don't like cold weather. And uh, <laughs> you know, um, so that was a big detractor for me. But when I got up there and met the, the people up there, just when, when, just like when I talked about Le the Lebanese people, um, you know, when I met the Alaskan people, um, the people are what Alaska is all about. It's not about the weather up there. It's about the people, the community, the working together and, and all that. So it was a, uh, for me, it was a life changing experience to go up there. I certainly plan on going up there again sometime. And uh, thank you very much, Lisa, for coming on and, and sharing some nuggets with us. We could do this for hours, I'm sure, but um, you really gave us a good light into the fire service in Alaska. And I, we appreciate it. Yeah. Kuyana. So Trevor. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Lisa, just echo Bobby's sentiments. Uh, thank you so much for coming in and sharing some of your thoughts and experience with us. You know, again, we could be on this webcast until this time tomorrow and still not cover everything that uh, you could be able to share with us. And I, I go back a little bit to what Bobby was saying. You know, just the, you know, the people in Alaska, the always very polite. But then when you get to know them, it, you can feel they have that sense of community and they, they bring you in, like you said. Um, and then they'll just you know, talk very openly with you. And you, you feel like you've been there for 20 years and you've only been there for 20 minutes. And yeah, I go back to what I was told by one of my officers years and years ago when you're given an assignment. And you really didn't feel like you had the resources or the knowledge or the background to do it. And he would look at you and go, make it work. And he'd walk away from you. And all of a sudden you said, well, okay, I, I got to figure this out. And it's amazing the ingenuity people will have, uh, and they already do have, that they can put to work. And I, I think you see that time and time again in these communities. We shared last night about the closest thing that we probably have to these micro rural communities would be, um, some of the island communities out in the Chesapeake Bay that are very secluded, they're cut off, they don't have roads, and portable pumps on golf carts might be what their fire suppression is. Or you look at a, um, a, cap a sea captain on a clam boat who uses a clam dredge to pump water onto the island for fire suppression. Well, that's not something that they teach in the IFSTA manual. I've never seen the clam boat section uh, in you know, IFSTA you know, chapter six. It's just not there. So, you know, the, the, if, if you give these folks a task, they will amaze you with not only their, you know, ability, but capability to get this done in the most efficient way possible, regardless of their budget. And, you know, of course, we all want to make sure that, you know, we have more, more, more. But then sometimes when you're tasked to do it with less under austere conditions, you know, whether it's a, a hurricane, an earthquake, a tsunami, which that freaked me out when I saw the tsunami signs up in Ketchikan. Um, with arrows pointing up the hill. Um, that's another story. But it's it, it's just, uh, you know, it's truly amazing to see. And, and Lisa, we want to thank you for that. Um, one other thing, just to put it in perspective, we talk about the community risk reduction. And even in my community uh, that I'm serving now, relatively small community with a lot of target hazards. And annually, we'll do fire extinguisher training with our community association, as well as the business community, the hotels, motels, high rises, marinas. And it's great. So as part of community risk reduction, we teach as many people as we can, um, hands-only CPR, uh, AED use, and fire extinguishers. Well, uh, Lisa brought up a great point in our conversations previously. Well, yeah, sure, we could, we could put a box of fire extinguishers in that, uh, what you call it, fire department in a box, the Connex container, but we can't run down to the Lowe's or Home Depot there in the village and spend 40 bucks on a fire extinguisher. By the time it comes by planes, trains, and automobiles to this remote village, that $35 extinguisher is now a $400 fire extinguisher. And you know, and we train on it, then we discharge it, now we go go get another one. And you know, not that the training's not important, not that the equipment or the, uh, you know, the process isn't important, but just the logistics to even get one fire extinguisher in a village is you know, mind blowing and it's something that we take for granted definitely in the lower 48. Um, last two things, uh, I'm still looking at the picture of that, I guess it's like a 16 to one mechanical advantage for pulling a whale across the ice. Uh, never seen that before, there it is. And then I don't know if you can pull up the picture of the uh, the one that you had with the bears going through the trash. Like you said, the, your, your bears are like our raccoons, 
but um, I, I remember seeing a bear up in Ketchikan and mentioning it to one of the local guys up there and saying, wow, you know, that's, that's a big bear. I'd never seen a bear really outside of a zoo. And uh, yeah, there you go. And those, uh, at least you can tell us whether this is accurate or not, but he might've been messing with me. But when I call that a big bear, he goes, no, those are cuddle size. They won't bother you. So I, I took his word for it and just kind of left on that. But um, you know, again, Lisa, just want to thank you for you know, what you do in those rural communities and you know, bringing this knowledge and perspective to our viewers tonight. So thank you so, so much. And uh, we hope to have you on again. Stay safe up there. Thank you. Oh, oh and cheers. We forgot to, yeah, we forgot to oh. cheers. Cheers. So Lisa, if you could take us to the, the, the exit slides. Yep. And then we're going to go like this. So again, from the strike the box, special thanks to captain Lisa shield from the Alaska state uh, fire marshal's office, the rural fire training specialist. Lisa, if you want to pronounce those, um, oh. <laughs> I'm not even, I'm not even gonna attempt. So, yeah. So, uh, so some of them I, I would actually butcher pretty bad. I have not, I have not been able to perfect Atna, um, the Khoikhan or the Daina or the Gwich'in. Um, but the Alutik, Sukpiak and Yupik, Kuyana is the most common thank you in Alaska. Um, so if you can just say Kuyana, then you've got it. Kuyana. So, um, so there's there's Captain Shields' contact information. So if we have anybody out in um, rural Alaska, hopefully you're watching. Apparently I didn't learn anything through all of this, but um, hopefully you guys are watching. Please reach out to Lisa. She's awesome as you guys have seen and learned. Um, anybody else uh, that has been watching and tuning in or will watch later, if you guys have questions, please feel free to contact her. Again, um, be ready, charge your phone, two, and a, two hours, 15 minutes. Um, and it, that was a two way conversation. It wasn't just Lisa talking or just me talking. It was, it was a great conversation, but um, you, if you guys need help getting up with, um, or trying to, to figure things out, you're in a rural setting. Um, I'm, I'm telling you, she's not gonna lead you wrong. Um, so there's her contact information. If you get it, one more. And then if you wanna follow Strike the Box on social media, here's all of our stuff. Our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, our website where we have all of our Thirsty Thursday um, webcasts. Uh, they are posted on there. Uh, and then our email address, so if you wanna reach out uh, and questions for Trevor, Bobby, and I, uh, please definitely do that. And then one more, Thursday, Thursday, number 12, navigating the promotional process. So next, or Thursday, Thursday, August 20th at 7 p.m. Again, on Facebook and YouTube, we're going to have Deputy Fire Chief Jimmy Gladwell of the Salisbury Fire Department, uh, currently the uh, Deputy Chief of the Administrative Services, uh, but he's going to join us and talk about the promotional process and um, all that kind of stuff and everything that goes with that. So with that, that concludes another Thirsty Thursday. We hope you all enjoyed it. We appreciate you watching and we'll see you in two weeks. Have a good night and stay safe. Nakuyamotin.